I'm Christine Blower and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to the closing rally of today's wonderful Arise event uh, on taking the fight to the Tories and coming up with socialist solutions, of which of course we all know there are plenty. For those of you joining the tens of thousands of people who've already tuned in today uh, on various platforms, this event is hosted by Arise, a festival of labour left ideas, along with a range of left organisations, campaigns and publications. And many thanks to all of you for coming along and of course to all our speakers. Today's event is the culmination of 15 months of online events, of forums, of rallies, uh, hosted and streamed with hundreds of thousands of views. And I'd like to thank in particular Patrick Foley and all the volunteers for all the work they've done on making sure that this could actually come to fruition. We're really delighted to have had so many different speakers and organizations join us. That sense of solidarity of how many there are of us and bringing people together is really, uh, is really important to be able to have these discussions. You know, we've heard how the Tories have had the, one of the worst and most reactionary responses to the, in the world to the coronavirus, but not just the coronavirus, to everything. This is a terrible government. They don't have anywhere near the agenda needed to tackle the climate emergency, and they're using the pandemic to further restructure the economy in the interests of the super rich and away from the many. Such a prospect means that the left must rise to the challenges ahead. And this means working together within the Labour Party and of course, outside and beyond it. It means that at the heart, we need to be at the heart of organising anti-Tory resistance including of course, uh, and in particular through trade unions, but in our localities and in our communities. And it means not abandoning the struggle in the Labour Party either. We must do all we can to seek to defend the gains that we made in recent years, which face sustained attacks uh, from the ruling class and those who, don't, who do their bidding, who, who simply don't want our movement to be successful. So, if you can, please donate, uh, as Lee said at the end of the last session, so that we can make sure that we carry on being able to have these events, to bring these ideas together, to clarify them and to move the struggle forward. Uh, and without further ado, I'm now going to move on to our speakers. I can't see everyone on my screen, so I'm going to, uh, I'm going to introduce John McDonnell in the fervent hope that he is actually on the call at the moment. Um, John McDonnell MP, founder of Claim the Future. He is, of course, the former Shadow Chancellor and a great friend of the Arise Festival. And assuming that John is with us, which I can't quite see if he is, but if up, oh, no John yet, I'm being told. In that case, in that case, Sean, I'm going to give you the heads up that I'm going to move. Instead of calling John, who was due to be our first speaker, I'm going to ask Sean Errington to give a specific plug for Arise and what we've been doing. Luckily, I saw you on the screen, Sean. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Christine. Um, I just wanted to take a, a quick moment, really, um, at the start of this closing rally to what has just been a completely brilliant day um, and I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who has participated. We've had campaigners and activists from campaigns such as NHS Workers Say No, Stop the War, Momentum, Campaign for Labour Party Democracy, South Asia Solidarity Tribune, the People's Assembly, Palestine Solidarity Campaign, Save Our Socialists, The Morning Star and of course our socialist MPs. So it's been really really fantastic that all those people have um, taken time out to to come and speak today. Um, also wanted to send best wishes to Kat Hobbs, Belle Rabira Addy MP, Laura Pickock and Lara McNeil who sadly had to give apologies but were hoping to take part today. Um, and I think like also especially a massive thank you to every one of you who have watched and listened today. It's been really, really fantastic. We've had over 1,500 of you across all the different Dreams. And as this um, as this video like stays on the YouTube um, page, uh, 
we know that thousands and thousands more will watch it in the coming weeks because we've seen that happen with previous events. So that's really, really fantastic. And as I mentioned in the opening session as well, we know that there are hundreds of you from all across the country able to take part. And it's been really, really great on the participants list seeing how there's a massive core of you that have stayed with us uh, all day, um, like bobbing off during the breaks to make cups of tea. And we've also seen uh, plenty of you come in and out as well and take part in different sessions. So that's been absolutely fantastic. Um, and it's been really great as well to see some of you acting on the campaign links that have been posted in the chat. Um, a particular link that I wanted to draw your attention to uh, is uh, to the donate link that we've posted throughout the day. And we're always really clear that like, um, only donate if you can. But the reason why it's really important is that actually events such as these do still have costs. Um, much like when we are in physical meetings as a venue hire, actually there is a cost of putting on Zoom webinar and restreaming and so on. Um, a lot of all of this is put together by volunteers uh, giving up freely of their time. And it's really important to us that we're able to continue to have events such as these and that they're freely accessible to everyone. So please, if you can do donate, every little bit helps us um, to, to keep events such as these going. I also wanted to flag up two future events um, that are taking place that people will be interested in. Obviously, we've mentioned it a few times during today, um, but we're going to be on the People's Assembly demonstration on June 26th in a socially distanced and safe way. But we hope to see as many of you there as possible as well. And another event which is coming up, which is hosted by our media partner, Labour Outlook, which is the Labour Outlook Forum on July 3rd. And it's the next in a series of events called um, on, in the Why Socialist series. And this one is Why Socialists Support a United Ireland with Sinn Féin MP Francie Malloy. And um, the last thing I'm going to do before handing back to Christine is I want to read out a message uh, from someone who sadly couldn't make it uh, today, but he is a Labour Party member and a member of parliament, uh, and that's why he should have the whip restored. It's <laughs> Jeremy, who was uh, speaking at the Palestine today. It's also accompanied by a rather fantastic picture of like an enormous crowd. Um, so we'll see if we can share that. Um, but he says, um, greetings. The G7 are faced with crises on, in our environment, COVID, poverty, inequality, and the denial of human rights. None of this will be solved by wars, weapons or neoliberal economics. Let us draw strength from defeating um, uh, fights at home, such as fire and rehire, and taking inspiration from those who win power back, such as in Bolivia. Um, we need to, a platform to follow COVID by the redistribution of power and wealth here and around the world. We are many and we are very determined. Arise, Jeremy Corbyn. So solidarity to Jeremy and... Um, the, the Palestine demo today looked fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to hand back to Christine now. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. And uh, we will be hearing much more about Palestine later in this rally. But I just want to say that here in West London, where I am, uh, it wasn't the size of the demonstration that Jeremy was on, but we did have splendid banners saying from Grenfell to Gaza, from Shepherd's Bush to Sheikh Jarrah, solidarity which i think is i think was a brilliant activity this morning okay so now we move to our, our next speaker who i know is here because i can see him on my screen it's sam browse of labor outlook and an arise volunteer sam the floor is yours hi uh, thanks christine uh yeah uh, so i'm here on behalf of labor outlook uh as um chance kind of already elaborated labor outlook is a media partner of um arise festival um, we, we publish kind of news and views of the Labour left um, and uh, quite a few of our regular columnists are on this call right now as I'm speaking. Uh, so uh, check us out. Um, you can see uh, uh, you can see our website in the link and just another plug for that event on July 3rd as well. Why socialists support a united island? To find out why, come along to the event. They're interactive. It's all about discussion and debate. Um, so see you there. OK, uh, it was Rosa Luxemburg who said, if you don't move, <laughs> you won't feel your chains. And in 2015, the people moved and that movement found expression in the campaign of Jeremy Corbyn, propelling him into the leadership of the largest left party 
in Europe. And the conditions, I firmly believe, and Outlook firmly believes, leading to that eruption haven't fundamentally changed. In fact, the pandemic has meant they've intensified. So our so socialist solutions were the only solutions then, and so they are now. The economies have just pitched from juddering stagnation into nosedive, the muscular liberalism that conceived the interventions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and in Libya have transformed into a kind of out and out imperial nostalgia. We heard all about that in the last session. And the racist go home vans have been matched indeed by the scandal of Windrush and the latest deportation of black British people. And all the while the climate emergency has become more urgent while the Tories fiddle with the same market solutions that created the crisis in the first place. But people still continue to fight from the NHS workers demanding a 15% pay rise, all those workers demanding an end to poverty, sick pay, and to the scandal of fire and rehire tactics, the Black Lives Matter activists tearing down the monuments for our colonial past, the countless young people protesting their right not to inherit a burning planet, the hundreds of thousands of people who marched for the rights of Palestinians just a few week weekends ago and today, as we've just heard, and the heroic Glasgow community that lay beneath the, um, the border control buses to stop the deportation of one of their own. And I might also add to, um, leading back to what uh, Sean said earlier on, all those going to the People's Assembly demonstration on the 26th of June, which you should all attend too. People continue to strain against the change. So the Labour Party in all of this has a choice. It can stand aside and it can watch, or even worse, it can become the jailer too, cracking down on its own internal democracy to prevent discussion and debate and to prevent that tide of those movements from flooding into the party. Or it can be the instrument for breaking those chains and unfettering all those who fight to put people before profit. And that's our task, I think, on this call today, to aid that transformation and bring those struggles into the party so that Labour becomes not only the tribune of our members, but of the movements in our streets, in our communities, and in our workplaces struggling for a better world too. And that means forming a coalition based not on waving flags or attempting to appeal to the law and order imperial nostalgia of Tory votes and Tory voters, but based on a vision of society that unites everyone from the so-called red wall to the city centres in defending and extending living standards and offering a place for Britain in the world that engages constructively with the decline of American empire and the new multiple multipolar realities that we face. So that's our choice, I think. And it's a choice of all people who claim to be progressives uh, in Britain today, because comrades, the people are moving. They're straining against their chains. And the only thing that will break those chains are the white heat of our solidarity and the strong and steady beat of our socialism. So thank you today. Thank you for attending. Thank you for, for having me and solidarity. Sam, that was, uh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that for that contribution. Uh, and now, uh, and now, comrades, we are joined by John McDonnell. But you know, it's uh, he, he's it's so great to be able to have John with us that introducing him twice, I think, is not really once too many. So now we're going to hear from John, as I said earlier, founder of Claim the Future, former Shadow Chancellor, and a great friend of the Arise Festival. John, thank you very much for being here. The screen is yours. <laughs> Christine, you've disappointed me. I thought in your long tradition as a teacher, you're going to tell me off for being <laughs> late as usual. Okay, can let me apologise for being late. I've, I just want to. I, people have said a lot today, from what I hear, on range of policies, etc. I just want to just lay a few words, really, which is the reason I'm late is because actually our movement is mobilising so effectively right the way across the country on so many issues. I've been, I spoke today at the Osimi Brown demonstration. People will know about Osimi, the way in which this young man who's on the autism spectrum has been treated, um, ne neglected as a child in terms of the support from the state his family should have got, imprisoned in the, the use of um, joint endeavour in the same way that so many young people have unfairly, unjustly, then comes out and now in true Windrush tradition, and now trying to send him to Jamaica where he, his family never, well, he came here when he was four. Absolutely, it's just brutal. But what was great today, there were 150 people outside the home office chanting in support of Asuma and then demonstrating 
all the way into Parliament Square. And you couldn't move in Parliament Square because you then, I spoke at the Palestine demonstration as well, which was huge, absolutely massive. And again, populated, to be frank, populated largely by young people. And it was just absolutely inspiring. I said at the Palestine demonstration, actually, that look, I agree we should be demonstrating outside Parliament, but I think now it's time to start demonstrating in the heart of the city of London because the banks and the finance sector in this country financed apartheid in South Africa. They're now financing apartheid in Israel. So what we should be doing is now absolutely solidly swinging behind the boycott sanctions and disinvestment campaign overall. And I, what, I followed a couple of speakers, Jewish comrades, and they were so courageous and I, it was just admirable. I can't, I can't respect them enough because you know what will happen now is that they'll be condemned by trolls on social media as self-hating Jews because they stood up for the Palestinian people. But it was just wonderful. And I just want to say also, you know, with, with securing successes, I know people are still, even now, still recovering from December uh, 2019 lost the general election, but the, the way in which people have bounced back by direct action has been terrific. But also, we're winning. We're winning again. I was part of the campaign in unison, the unison broad left, the time for real change campaign. We've just won a majority on the NEC of unison. Even we didn't win the general election campaign, the general secretary election, because there was a split there's a lesson there for Unite, and I'm hoping this weekend that our comrades in Unite will be able to resolve whatever differences there are and they come out with a single left candidate. Because Unison stood to, the Unison left then learned that lesson, stood together, and we've won an overwhelming majority on the Unison executive, which will have ramifications for the national executive of the Labour Party as well. I expect the bureaucrats within Unison head office will do everything they can to undermine our election victory, but we'll slug that out and we'll succeed again. I just want to pay tribute to those people who organised so effectively in the union. And what was great about today was that there were people there advertising the People's Assembly demonstration in a few weeks' time. And again, mobilising for that. And I think it will be big. We need to make it big and we need to I think make sure it's a consolidation of the work that we're doing in our trade unions in the Labour Party and beyond and all the other campaigns. And the final point I make is that I think people have woken up to what we're facing at the moment. And some of the discussions from what I've heard today are doing that. We're dealing with a proto-fascist government. We're dealing with a proto-fascist government. What does that mean? It's a government that fails to recognise some of the basic democratic institutions and democratic norms that we've developed across the globe. But particularly in this country, I've been doing this, I've launched this podcast series on the history of class struggle in our country. We didn't achieve the sort of the right to vote. We didn't achieve the right to organise in trade unions or we didn't achieve the right to have some basic welfare state without real struggle and without real sacrifices. People died for these rights in many of those struggles. And again, what we've got to do now is recognise this is a government that doesn't respect any of those institutions or any of those norms they're tearing them up and that's exactly what the police and crime bill will do it will try to outlaw protest the the way in which people can normally assemble it will also undermine democratic free speech and it just goes on and on under this government so we've got to recognize what we're dealing with usually in a proto-fascist government or a fascist government usually that government is corrupt well we have an inherently corrupt regime at the moment and it's uh, the contract awards to each other their mates etc but also the corruption of the operation of government. And we saw that with the denial of the freedom of information requests from journalists and the campaign that the NUJ has just waged and again, beating them in court on that particular issue. So I think we know now what we're up against. So how do we respond? Well, in parliament, Richard is here, we'll tell you, in parliament, we'll do everything we possibly can. And but I have to say also now we've got a revolutionary cell in the House of Lords with Christine and others. <laughs> We'll be able to do all we can to undermine them in both chambers now and prevent legislation going through. But with their majority, in most instances, they'll be able to force it through. So what does that mean? Well, we have to fall back then on direct action and industrial action. And I just give you one example of what came in the discussions today on the Simi Brown case. Is that if they come to try and de deport a Simi, um, let's do what they did in Glasgow. Let's make sure that actually we turn up in our large numbers, the mass of the people to prevent that sort of abuse going on. 
And it's the same when it comes to industrial action or climate change campaigning now. It's the point that we made in, in our manifestos time and time again. We can, we're, the, we're the many, they're the few, and the many will always win out by force of numbers, but also by force of commitment and the force of mobilization. So I think that's where we are. And to, a day like today is to ensure that actually we have a firm ideological base to our arguments and our campaign. And I'll say this one final point. We developed an ideological base in the discussions in the party through the 2017, 2019 manifestos. They were, I think they were excellent pieces of work that we were all involved in. And they took us onto a, a different plateau in terms of understanding the way society works and how we can change it. We need to go further now. It requires much more radical change because the, well, first of all, because the existential, existential crisis that we face in terms of the threat of climate change, but also they need to be much more radical because the scale of poverty that we, that we experience within our society as well, as well as the way in which our public service has been stripped by privatization impact upon by pandemic. So therefore, part of our job is exactly as today, think through the ideas that we have to develop, think through the program that we need for the future. The Labour Party has launched its policy review. There's a real fear that this will be an exercise in dumping the last two manifestos. What we've got to do now is say, actually, hold Keir Starmer to his word. He said the last two manifestos were his foundational document. They are for us. They're the foundations upon which we can radicalise. They're also put out a consultation paper about the, how they develop policy in the Labour Party. But what we've got to do is make sure we express our views that our policy will be determined by our members democratically and always will be. And that means the sovereignty of conference is upheld. Just on those final points then, Christine, I'm, I'm ebullient about the mobilisation that's going on right the way across our movement. I'm absolutely, I can't explain just how enthused I am by the way in which ideas are being thrown up in meeting after meeting, which I think are going to take us onto a different plane in terms of the political struggles that we have and the understanding of the world that we have. So all we need now actually is solidarity. And that's what I think people are expressing throughout. Solidarity. John, thank you so very much. I have to say in a very long teaching career, that is without a doubt the best excuse and explanation for lateness I've ever heard. I mean, the fact is, John, it, you are doing more than one person normally expects to be able to do it. It's certainly in a day and probably in a lifetime. So thank you very much for being here. Was, uh, those were great words. Um, I'm going to move now to our next speaker, whom I, I must say, through the, um, through the Momentum Group in Hammersmith and Fulham and Kensington, Chelsea, I've heard the uh, pleasure of hearing on many occasions. It is Shanali Bhattacharya from the Momentum NCG. Shanali, up to you. Oh, thanks, Christine. Uh, and thanks so much for having me. And, and your local Momentum group are inspirational. So um, massive big up to Hammersmith and Fulham, who um, are just an awesome bunch of comrades and are really leading the way in showing what a local Momentum group is capable of. So thank <laughs> you. Um, so hello, I'm Shanali Bhattacharya, and thank you for having me here uh, this, this evening now. Um, at this really crucial and precarious moment for our movement, um, which I think John has outlined really well there. Um, so here at Momentum, like we understand our key challenge in collaboration with all of you, all of our comrades across the UK left, is to ensure that the hundreds and thousands of activists ignited or re-energized by Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party must remain active in our movement. And we really need to break that down and work out what that looks like, which I know so many of us are already starting to do. Um, we can't pretend that this is gonna be easy. Um, there are relentless factional attacks from the right wing of the Labour Party that probably most of us have individually experienced. And of course, as John outlined, there's an increasingly hard right and authoritarian government um, who uh, we cannot, you know, we cannot pretend um, how, how critical this moment is. But I'd also say, I'd echo other speakers here, that again and again, we see the resilience and the determination within our movement. Uh, so John talked about units and left activists winning a historic majority on the, their NEC, like an enormous, huge love to NEC, to, to units and left activists, amazing work. We've seen the incredible solidarity of that coalition who formed around Kill the Bill uh, against the Policing Crimes Sentencing and Courts Bill, um, which it will empower an already racist and brutal police force. 
force even further. And we've seen the largest ever Palestine demonstrations in UK history over the past few weeks, as well with an incredible occupation of, of the Elbit site in my hometown of Leicester. I'm so proud of Leicester Comrades. Um, the inspirational anti-racist community organising against deportations in Glasgow. And of course, even in the local elections, we saw Preston and Salford councils bucking the national trend uh, through a programme of municipal socialism and community wealth building. So Momentum's three year strategy, socialist organising for a new era recognises the importance of all of this how the struggle exists in our workplaces, in our communities, in grassroots campaigns and inside the party where comrades are organising despite the right wing. We recognise all of these wins that I've mentioned here and many others represent hours of work of deep organising and graft by many, many committed activists working in coalition and demonstrating that resilience and determination we badly need to defend our communities and build socialism from the ground up. So what does this look like within Momentum? We've been working to refound local Momentum groups, uh, once again, like the wonderful Hammersmith and Fulham across the country, supporting members to become organisers and fostering democratic decision-making on local campaign priorities. So Momentum groups are socialist hubs in their communities, uh, and we're supporting activists to become confident organisers with the skills and confidence to campaign against cuts, food poverty, NHS privatisation, unemployment and evictions, all of those challenges that we know we're facing on the ground in our communities. Our national eviction resistance campaign has seen over 30 housing action groups established nationally, working in collaboration with local renters unions and skilling our members up to campaign confidently and effectively. We've just launched the Leo Panic Leadership Programme with the first cohort about to engage in comprehensive training to develop our members' political education, strategic understanding and organising skills and networking those members across the country. And we've just launched, I hope you've all seen, Momentum Trade Unionists to encourage every Momentum member to become an active member of their trade union, to enable the networking of rank and file trade unionists across our movement and to facilitate political education in workplace struggles, how to challenge bosses and how to win. And we're continuing to prepare left candidates for council selection through our future councillors programme, while also developing understanding of municipal socialism and community wealth building among our members. Uh, we've got a brilliant meeting coming up next Wednesday with Matt Brown, Rianne e. Jones and our co-chair Gaia Swiss Canton. So I really hope you'll all join that. So this year's Labour Party conference, which John alluded to, will be a crucial arena for our movement to defend and expand upon the advances we made in 2017 and 2019. A few weeks ago, we saw the results of Momentum's first ever democratic policy primary with local groups, affiliates and campaign organisations all drafting and submitting the motions they want Momentum to prioritise at conference. And that ended with an OMOV ballot of our, all of our members. Only we on the left have the ideas to meet the triple challenge of COVID, climate catastrophe and capitalism. And we're also working, we're, sorry, we're deepening our working relationship with a brilliant World Transform team to develop political education to our members as part of the brilliant annual festival that always runs alongside Labour Party Conference, but also throughout the year. Uh, 2020 and 2021 saw momentum partnering with TWT and Labour Campaign for Trans Rights on a much needed trans liberation political education programme designed and led by trans comrades. We're now building on that with sessions around building a socialist feminist movement for the 21st century in the run up to women's conference and also a, a momentum racial justice program, which will see momentum partnering with organizations doing vital work in and around migrant rights and racial justice to deepen discussion and understanding within our movement, to mobilize our members in support of key grassroots campaigns and to foster the self organization of all of our black, Asian and ethnic minority members. So the bottom line is all of this work is being undertaken by enormous numbers of activists doing the hard graft to create the building blocks that we need to build socialism from the ground up. In the coming weeks, we'll also be inviting members and local groups to build a new blueprint for momentum to reshape our constitution for this new era, because like all of us, we have to be as resilient and as defiant as ever. So if you're not a member, please join us, join your local group. If you don't have a local group, maybe you're the one to start one, join Momentum Trade Unionists, join the fight against the housing crisis. Momentum is the members, and we look forward to working with all of you here this evening. Solidarity. Shani, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And having heard you before, I, I knew that was going to be good. 
And I just repeat that we're in Hammersmith and Fulham, we're now working with Kensington and Chelsea. So, so from all of the local activity where they were doing on housing and, uh, and all of the other issues, building momentum, talking about community organizing, always talking about trade unions. Uh, yes, indeed, we have got an international dimension. Uh, and as I said earlier, on the streets today, we did have banners that said, Grenfell to Gaza, Shepherd's Bush to Sheikh Jarrah. And the fact is that if socialists are anything, they are internationalists. So we're absolutely delighted to be joined today by, uh, by a special guest, Kamal Hawash, who is the chair of the, Palestinian Solid of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, of which I am absolutely delighted uh, to be a patron. Kamal is a leading uh, is a leading activist in the Palestinian community here in Britain, and a and a staunch defender and promoter of the need for freedom and justice for the Palestinians. Kamal, the floor is yours, and we're delighted to have you with us. Unmute. Thank you so much, Christine, for your introduction. And we're very proud that you're one of our patrons, as is Jeremy Corbyn. We're very proud of you both as patrons of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Uh, I'm grateful to Arise for asking me again to come and speak. Arise is a good word because the Palestinian people have risen. They have risen as one people across the whole of historic Palestine, from Haifa to Yaffa to Gaza, Jerusalem, Ramallah. They have risen as one people. And that was initiated, uh, as it happens, by Israel acting in such an awful way, starting with a plan to evict the Palestinian people from Sheikh Jarrah. One of the families in Sheikh Jarrah is my late cousin's family. So I've been in touch with them today and I brought a message to the uh, demonstration, which I was pleased to close earlier on. They asked us this question. They said, what do you call a situation where one people in a community are evicted from their homes and another people moved illegally by an occupying state into their homes as Israel plans to do with Sheikh Jarrah. And the answer is simple. It is called racism and it's called apartheid. So it's really important that everybody now takes it as a given that Israel is an apartheid state and then says, well, okay, if that's the case, what action should we be taking? And that was the, the purpose of the demonstration today, following a huge uh, uh, petition, which was signed by 380,000 people calling for a parliamentary debate about sanction against Israel. Uh, so on Monday, parliament will be debating this. And of course, I have no doubt that uh, the socialist group and, and other MPs will be speaking in favor of saying enough is enough. Israel can't have the impunity that it enjoys. We must impose sanctions uh, uh, against Israel. Let me just very briefly uh, explain what BDS stands for, because sometimes people hear the, the acronym, but they're not sure what it means or what it stands for. So boycott, divestment, and sanction. We as people can boycott. Then there can be divestment, such as by a local pension uh, uh, groups, that they can divest from companies complicit in the occupation, especially companies on the UN register of, of 200 companies, a number of them British, that uh, uh, are complicit in the occupation. But the S, the sanctions, is the one we are calling for, which is where governments say enough is enough. Israel is an apartheid state, and therefore we must act. But the accusation is that movement is somehow anti-Jewish. It isn't. If you take them one at a time, what are the demands? Uh, first of all, the demand is for the end to, end to the occupation. That is a legitimate, legal, and moral demand. Secondly, equal rights for all citizens of Israel. That is a legal and moral request. And thirdly, the right of return of the Palestinian people to their home. That, again, in international law, is a legal right, and it's a moral issue. So BDS and its demands are about pressuring Israel to comply with international law, to fulfill the obligations that it has as it claims to be a normal state, but Israel refuses to do that and that is why the label sticks to it. So it's very important that uh, uh, people who very much uh, care about human rights, as we heard about a number of examples, deportations and so on, well, let's not forget that 
Britain promised my homeland, and I'm Palestinian as well as the chair of the Palestine Solidarity Campaign, campaign, it actually promised our land to a people who didn't come from it. So the problem started there, and it is now incumbent on the British government to stand up for the rights of the Palestinian people and to, to ensure that they, the rights are delivered to them. It was shameful for our prime minister to say to conservative friends of Israel uh, in, in a letter that although Britain supported the International Criminal Court, it made an exception of Israel. And the reason it made an exception of Israel was, was twofold. Israel, he says, are not, is not a member of uh, the International Criminal Court and Palestine isn't a state. Well, those who remember the last war on Gaza in 2014 will also remember that Parliament, the British Parliament, voted to require the, uh, the government to recognize the state of Palestine, which to this day remains an unfulfilled position. The Labour Party has committed to immediately recognize uh, Palestine when it uh, gets into government. Uh, and we know that the, the leadership of the uh, Labour Party has changed, but that commit commitment must be upheld. And it is time, and it was good to see Keir Starmer mention Palestine at the last prime minister's question, but it was a little too late really. Apart from anything else, he's refused to meet the Palestinian community, which I think is an absolute disgrace. And he should immediately pick up the phone to the Palestinian community and talk to them. So we, I, I end my remarks by saying we very much want support from across the board because the Palestinian cause is a just cause. But we realize that there are lots of socialists who very much support the Palestinians in their attempt to, to attain uh, their rights to freedom, justice, and equality. So I thank the, the MPs and today John McDonald and, and uh, Jeremy came and spoke at the protest, but I know that others would have come if it was possible for them uh, logistically. So thank you all very much indeed for your support to the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people are, are, are united as one. They want to end the scourge of this apartheid regime that rules them and they want to be free like any other people. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. Kamal, thank you so much for, for being with us. And, and of course, we all know that as Mandela said, no one is free, no one will be free until the Palestinians are free. So why don't you write to your, uh, why don't you write to your MP and say, not you Kamal, but everybody, write to your MP and say, Let's have a meeting with uh, Hussam Zumlot, the Palestinian ambassador, who will be able to say, as Kamal has done, exactly what the British government should be doing in these positions. And who will be able to say that, you know, this supporting the Palestinians has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. That's a really critical message for people to hear. This is about freedom and justice for the Palestinians. OK, so thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, and we will continue to support on the streets, in our unions, in our classrooms, and wherever we can until the Palestinians, uh, till the Palestinian cause has been uh, achieved. So um, now we move to our next speaker, who is Dave Allen from the TUC uh, Disabled, he's a TUC Disabled Workers Representative, uh, and he is also a member, as we can see from his very fine polo shirt, of Unite the Union, Dave. The floor is yours. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, comrades, for inviting me to address this uh, wonderful festival. First of all, solidarity, everyone. And can I say, first of all, I would prefer not to be addressing you here today, as the only reason I am here is because my close friend and colleague, Sean McGovern, who normally spoke for disabled trade unionists, sadly passed away last year. He's sadly missed by many people on this webinar today. Sean was one of the true heroes of both the trade union movement and the disabled people's movement, and he effortlessly brought the two together. He was a tireless champion for disabled people. His passion, dedication, and strategic insight is missed. And so his sense of humor, his flawless style, and the grace with which he conducted himself. Comrades, we must be upfront about the facts that this Tory government ignores or downplays. Across the UK, Six in 10 of all deaths involving COVID were disabled people. There have been over 125,000 people died. That means that over 75,000 disabled people have lost their lives. The Tories have made a myriad of excuses, including repeating the mantra that those who died were older people or had underlying health issues. But what the clear underlying meaning is that these lives, disabled people's lives, 
matter less than others. Disabled people have been forced to pay the price for government failings, often with our lives. Our government were looking into herd immunity while other governments were locking down their borders. Our government's initial strategy was herd immunity, protect the economy, and after, if that means some disabled people and pensioners die, just too bad. This was after one of the Prime Minister's aides had been publicly condemned for his views on eugenics. So those of us watching were not surprised by the government's initial response to the pandemic. There was a lot of work for our movement to do to ensure disabled workers are treated fairly and the barriers are removed. Our evidence, UNITE and the TUC's evidence, found in November 2020 that the disability peer gap had increased. In November, disabled workers earned an average 20% less than their non-disabled peers. This was an increase of about £800 a year compared with the 2019 findings. And in the last couple of months, the Office for National Statistics released new statistics. It found that the redundancy rates are 62% higher for disabled workers. The UK is in an economic crisis and a recession, and like the last time, disabled workers are the first to lose their jobs and the last to be rehired, and are experiencing negative changes to our interim work conditions. This is one reason why it's never more, been more important to be a member of a trade union. And the pandemic has brought to the foreground many of the issues facing disabled workers and disabled people. We have seen disabled workers step up and support our employers in less than ideal circumstances. We have continued to work from home, something we had been told for years was not possible without the reasonable adjustments we needed. However, it is now more than a year on since the first lockdown and many disabled, disabled workers are still working from home without the adjustments we need. We have heard that a year on, some disabled workers are still working from ironing boards or without the specialist software they require. Comrades, this is not acceptable. Work pro Place protections under the Equality Act have not changed under the pandemic. Employers need to meet their legal duties and put in place the adjustments workers need to do their jobs. Our members should not dread going into work because they believe they are being set up to fail. And earlier, I mentioned working from home, which is for many a reasonable adjustment. And for many, it is the reasonable adjustment they were told was not possible. Yet the pandemic has shown that for many, working from home has not only been possible, but a reality. We have seen a homework in revolution for disabled people, and this must not fade when the pandemic is passed. And not all disabled workers for, first to, forced to work from home have benefited from it. Some have said the isolation has had a negative impact on their mental health. However, other disabled members who have worked from home have told us that as a result, they were able to do their job better with less pain, less fatigue, and better allow them uh, to manage their time, health condition, or impairment. We in our movement must continu continue to ensure employers put in place and keep in place members' reasonable adjustments, including home working. And going forward, we must ensure home working is at the worker's request, not the employer's demands. And finally, let me end on this note. It is important we do not forget the social model of disability, a model that this movement and I remain utterly committed to. Disabled people must be seen as equal citizens with the same rights as everyone else. We must not forget that the Tory government were found by the United Nations Rapporteur of creating a human, a human catastrophe and that there was evidence of grave and systematic violation of the rights of people with disabilities. We don't beg, we don't plead, we are not a charity, nor what we are doing is demanding our rights, our rights as full and equal citizens. The social model recognises this and sees us. It will help us remove the barriers which stop our full participation in society. We must carry on fighting. We know we must strengthen our links with deaf and disabled people's organisations like DPAC and RUFA who are fighting back. But we can't do it alone. As many speakers have said today, we must be united together. I was part of a team with, along with Debbie Abrahams, the then Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, who wrote the Labour Manifesto for Disabled People for the 2017 general election, Nothing About You Without You. That is the kind of united working we must do. We must work together, we must fight together, and we must win. Solidarity. Dave, thank you very much indeed. And I'm, I'm sure that your, your mention of Sean McGovern was really important. I 
personally stood on many platforms and uh, spoke from many platforms with Sean, but I can tell you that people here on this call today will have been powerfully impressed today by the remarks that you made there on behalf of, uh, of disabled workers and disabled people. Indeed, nothing about us without us is a really critical slogan and it's it's true uh, it's true across the piece we must make sure that we st with, that we are in solidarity with our uh, our colleagues in the disabled workers movement so uh, we're coming we're coming close to the end of the of the rally now um, comrades and friends uh, and I'm going to make a few closing remarks before uh, handing the uh, handing the floor to our final speaker who will wind us up and send us on our way to make sure that we do everything we can to bring socialist policies to the fore. But I, I just want to say before we go to Richard that uh, it's, been, it's been a really inspirational day. In fact, it's been a reason, a really inspirational time throughout the whole of the Arise Festival. Uh, who would have known that we could actually have managed something so good online when we think about the ones that we did in person, which were fantastic, but we have actually managed something really good here. We know uh, that we are confronting a hideously reactionary and as, <clears throat> and as John McDonnell said, a proto-fascist agenda. So our work in Labour for socialist policies and, in, and for Labour Party democracy must go on so that we can show the alternative. It's really important that we leave today making sure <clears throat> that we will engage in all of the actions and activities that are being called for today, that we really can promote solidarity amongst our various groups and that we will be uh, on the streets uh, in the People's Assembly in the Arise block. So there's a lot to do, comrades. There's a world to win, but we can win it with solidarity. Uh, I'm sure that... I'm sure that Richard will have a great many things to say. So I close by saying we build resistance to the Tories, we popularise social, socialist solutions, and we do it together. And with that, Richard, I hand the microphone to you. Thanks very much, Christine, and thanks to uh, all the speakers, all the participants and all the attendees today. I very much enjoyed uh, listening to the uh, earlier speech, the different perspectives. It was great that there was a message from... Jeremy as well for today's closing rally and I'm glad that he spoke at the Palestine Solidarity demonstration near Downing Street today and as was mentioned earlier it's absolutely ridiculous we've got the situation where he's a Labour member and a member of Parliament but not a Labour member of Parliament as part of showing that we're serious about winning as a Labour Party and bringing the movement together the leadership needs to uh, readmit uh, Jeremy stop fighting uh, internal fights against the left and let's take the fight to the Tories but anyway having got that one off my chest again uh, thanks everyone again for organising today's uh, rally uh, like others uh, I've been at uh, a Palestine solidarity demonstration today uh, in Leeds and I want to offer my ongoing uh, solidarity to the Palestinian people. The bombs may have stopped, but the oppression continues. And it's up to everyone, everyone on this call today to continue fighting for the people of Palestine so that occupation ends and so that justice is done. And I'll be bringing a bill to Parliament in the coming weeks to end British weapon sales to Israel. And I hope that you'll all encourage your local members of Parliament to uh, back uh, that bill. Now we find ourselves, as speakers have said, in the middle of an extraordinary number of crises, the public health crisis, the economic crisis, a crisis of living standards that was happening way before COVID hit, a climate crisis and even a political crisis. So I very much think uh, that today's title uh, gets it bang on, socialist solutions to the crisis, because we on the left need to be winning the arguments in our party in our trade unions, in our communities, for the way out of these crises. Because I'll, I'll tell you something, the most powerful forces in society are discussing this, they're organising their solutions, solutions that will be paid for on the backs of the 99%. So just as they think, just as they organise, we have to think and we have to organise, but more effectively. Now, a year ago, as the COVID crisis hit, we heard all sorts of rhetoric, didn't we? All sorts of rhetoric about how this crisis would bring us closer together. 
one year on, we can see that this was a downright lie because the British billionaire class has increased its wealth by 106 billion during this crisis. That's 2,000 million pounds per week. That's 290 million pounds per day. So it's been a very good crisis for some, but it's been a disaster for the majority. So many people have needlessly lost their lives from COVID in our country alone. Tens and tens of thousands of people have needlessly lost their lives. We've seen the corporate takeover of the state with a growing stench of corruption as billions in COVID contracts are handed to those with friends in high places. We've seen the crisis used as cover for further privatisation and further outsourcing with track and trace handed over to Serco and the like. We've seen an education recovery fund that thinks working class kids deserve no more than a pound per day. We've seen disabled people given insulting 37 pence benefits increases and many on furlough expected to live on less than the minimum wage. We've seen the crisis used to drive down wages and conditions to fire and rehire. We've seen attempts to pit public sector workers against private sector workers as a ploy to force down public sector pay in a race to the bottom. Now, that's all quite depressing, isn't it? But I actually am feeling optimistic. Optimistic because this crisis has really shone a spotlight on the deep failings of 40 years dominated by neoliberalism, marketization, deregulation and privatization. So this can be, and it must be, the moment when we ditch all of that and build a better society. And I'm optimistic because the public agree with us. The public want change. The polls show people want a more inclusive, fairer, more equal society to be built out of this crisis. And I'm optimistic because the old ideas, they ran down our throats for decades, are on the way out. Those ideas are on the ropes. It wasn't too long ago that we were told the state had no role in the economy, that everything should be left to the invisible hand of the market, an invisible hand that robbed workers' pockets and handed their resources to the already super rich. Well, after the banking crisis and after this COVID crisis, nobody serious is saying there should be no role in the state in the economy. And it wasn't long ago either that we were being told that you had to lower taxes year after year after year to grow the economy. But whatever one thinks of the detail of the G7 tax deal last week, it's very different, very different to the rhetoric of the last 40 years. So I think that change is in the air. But if left to its own devices, it will mean a capitalist state serving the capitalist class, bailing out the billionaires and letting the rest of society simply sink. We need to fight for a people state that bails out the people. And here, the wind should be in Labour's sails. We've got a centrist president of the United States announcing the end of trickle-down economics, announcing massive investment in green energy, in modern transport, in high-speed broadband, in social care, in social security, and announcing taxes on the super-rich to fund this. And even the Tories have had to adopt the language of levelling up and building back better. Now, of course, that's empty rhetoric, but it does create a space which the left can exploit, a space that the left can use to fight for a better society. So now is the moment. Now is the moment to fight for society that serves the many, not the few. We are the majority. So let's fight for a 15% pay rise demanded by NHS staff. Let's fight for a proper pay rise for all public sector workers and for a real living wage of at least £10 per hour for all workers. Let's fight for an end to fire and rehire and let's fight for an end to zero hours contracts. Let's fight for a Green New Deal. Let's fight for millions of good unionised skilled jobs at its core. Let's fight for the building of a million council houses, for a social security system that ensures a dignified minimum income guarantee, for a right to food, for a right to free education, for an end to all NHS privatisation and for a national care service. And let's demand a windfall tax on the companies that have made super profits during this crisis and for a wealth tax on the super wealthy too. But the powerful, as we all know on this call, will never give an inch without a fight. So we need more than just ideas. Ideas are powerful, but on their own, 
aren't enough. We need to get organised around our ideas. We need to build the movements to win that new world. And the Tories will do everything, everything in their power to stop that. They will do their usual divide and rule. So when they come for migrants and travellers, we need to fight that. When they whip up a tax on Black Lives Matter, we need to fight that. Wherever they foster division, we need to build unity. Now, I know that um, I'm out of time. But I know that Matt, who does a great job at organising Arises events, wouldn't want me to end without mentioning the G7 summit. I'll be brief, but I think that the G7 leaders have two key tests. The first is on climate change. We'll only prevent the worst effects of climate change and keep global temperature rises below 1.5 degrees if the developed world meets its global commitments. That means not just doing its proper share so the world can halve emissions by 2030. It means delivering on the $100 billion per year commitment to help developing nations cut their emissions and cope with the impacts of climate change. The second big test that the G7 leaders need to pass, in my view, is to put an end to vaccine apartheid. Most countries don't have enough vaccines simply because the technology is being controlled by a handful of private companies. It's in private hands, even though the vaccines only exist because of massive public investment. As we see in India, millions of lives are at stake. Cornwall, host of the G7 summit, has had more vaccines than 22 African countries combined. More vaccinations than 22 African countries combined. How can that uh, be right? So the G7 leaders, especially our own prime minister, need to stop blocking the move by over 100 countries to waive the patents and drive up vaccine production. So to conclude, they're the socialist solutions we need to be fighting for. It's not going to be easy. But as Bob Crow said, if you fight, you don't always win. But if you don't fight, you will always lose. Looking at the increasing number of demonstrations around the country, looking at the increasing number of people at uh, calls like this, listening to the other speakers, seeing our trade unions fighting back, seeing our left MPs fighting back, seeing social movements expand and push forward. All of these things make me know that there's plenty of fight in our movement. The fight in our movement is increasing and we're going to fight. And I think that's why we're going to win. So thank you for everything that everybody on this call does. Let's carry on fighting together and let's win together. Richard, thank you very much for closing the rally. And I'll just say this. Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without a demand, never has, never will. We have the demands, comrades. We need to fight for them. Solidarity.